So this is lecture 18 um, and is going to be our last lecture um, on asymptotics, hopefully, um, before we start talking about hypothesis testing. And the title of this lecture is MLE asymptotics. And so kind of the second part or towards the end of this lecture, we're going to tie together some of the topics we've been talking about with um, asymptotic evaluation of estimators and try to tie it back together with um, our discussion about best estimators. Um, and that will kind of round off this unit here. So we should do a kind of quick recap of um, what we talked about last lecture. So we had a couple things we talked about. The main one we talked about was the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem basically talked about x bar or the mean. And it said that if I have some observations and they are independent and identically distributed with some mean, some common mean, right? They're identically distributed. They should have a common mean. And we'll just call that common mean mu and a common variance. We'll call it sigma squared, and that variance has to be finite. The reason we say the variance has to be finite and the mean doesn't is because of the variance. The variance being finite basically implies the mean is. But if we have this condition, then if we look at x bar minus mu over sigma, and we look at root n times this, this kind of properly normalized and standardized version of um, x bar will converge in distribution to a, a standard normal distribution. So this was our central limit theorem and it is a really kind of very broadly applicable theorem because you notice we say almost nothing about the random variable except that it's uh, it has a mean mu and some finite variance and basically other than that we don't really say much. Now Depending on what the uh, random variable is, some things will converge faster or slower to um, to the uh, to a standard normal, right? If if the x's are normal, then the we don't even have any convergence needed. It's just true that x bar minus mu over sigma times root n is standard normal. But if it's some, if the x come from something that's kind of close to being normal-ish, it will kind of converge faster. If it is something kind of far away from being normal-ish, um, like a uniform distribution, it will converge kind of very slowly to it. So this is the central limit theorem that says something about um, x bar. And the follow-on question of this is, what if I basically want some um, to talk about some uh, version of x bar? Uh, some transformation of it. And that gave us a second theorem, which is called the delta method. And the delta method says that, so it's a little more general, although it applies to the central limit theorem. It says that if we have a sequence of random variables, uh, a sequence of random variables. Let's just say, put some parens around it. It's a sequence of random variables where root n times y n minus some, you know, so it's a sequence of random variables with some parameter theta. And if we subtract off theta and we normalize by root n, that, and if that thing converges in distribution to some normal distribution with some variance, let's just say it's tau squared. Maybe we shouldn't use tau because we've used that before. What do we want to call it? Psi squared? All right, so this is a different tau than, say, the Kramer row lower bound. It doesn't, yeah, totally different. Just some variance. Could be sigma squared. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's just some variance. So if we have a sequence like this, so the, the obvious case is if if we take any kind of random variable and we look at x bar, you know, if we look at x bar n, and that is our y n, then that satisfies this condition, but it's, it's actually more general. So it's anything that kind of converges in, in this way. Um, then if 
we have g is a differentiable function and g prime of theta is non-zero then root n times instead of yn minus theta we can look at g of yn minus g of theta this wing will converge in distribution to a normal zero instead of psi squared we're going to get g prime theta quantity squared times psi squared so basically what it says is that if I have a sequence of random variables that in some nice way converges to some kind of normal and I want to look at a function of that random variable, maybe g of x bar, but generally g of y, it will basically converge, but we have to multiply the variance by g prime of theta squared. Now that g prime of theta comes up again, um, and that starts to feel a lot like the kramer rao lower bound, um, and it's basically derived from the same place using Taylor's theorem. Um, it's basically how this is proved. I won't go through the proof of this, um, but uh, we did that last time. So we can look at an example. We looked at some examples of the delta method last time. A more advanced example of the delta method is something called the variance stabilizing transformation. And the variance stabilizing transformation, so we have this kind of asymptotic um, normality notation where we can basically say that um, if we were to look at, say, what the above delta method theorem says is that, Let me write this out, is that yn is, what we could say is it's asymptotically normally distributed with a mean theta and a variance psi squared over n. So that's another way of writing um, this line here. And this, this psi might depend on theta. So psi squared may depend on theta, so there might be some mean variance relationship. Now, if you have something like a, uh, it doesn't have to, but it, it could. Um, so we'll do a, a concrete example, but like a Poisson uh, distribution, it's, uh, you know, the variance depends on, is the same thing as the mean, so certainly it depends on the mean. And the question that the variance stabilizing transformation asks is, is there a transformation g so that maybe not exactly but at least asymptotically if we look at g of y this thing will be asymptotically normal with a mean let's say g of theta um, but we're going to have some variance whatever this thing is this doesn't depend on, on theta. And so how do we solve this? Well, we use the delta method because the delta method says that g of y is basically asymptotically normal um, <clears throat> with a mean g of theta and a variance, which is g prime, uh, g prime theta squared times psi squared. And so what we want is that this thing, we want to, to find a g so that g prime theta squared and you could even denote here that psi might depend on theta 
psi squared. So you can think of it as psi of theta, depends on theta. We basically want to choose our g so that this thing is constant, is stabilized, doesn't depend on theta. And so what we get is basically a, um, a condition using the delta method that says that we basically need to choose our g. It says choose g such that if I take its derivative, I square it, and I multiply by whatever the variance is, psi so theta squared, this thing is some constant. Let's just call it c, which is just some constant. <clears throat> so we basically have ourselves here um, a differential equation. So this thing is basically an ordinary dif differential equation, ODE. I know this is not technically a prerequisite of the course, so this will not show up on any exam. So it's a cute little example that relates back to ODEs. Um, and uh, so how would, let's look at a concrete example of this. Okay, so let's assume that we have some x's that are iid, maybe from a Poisson distribution with a mean lambda. Then um, what do we know? The CLT says you could write it one of two ways. The kind of fancier stats way to write it is root n x bar minus, um, and x bar depends on how many samples, so we can write x bar n minus what's our mean lambda over root lambda. We, you could say that that converges in distribution to a standard normal. Or an equivalent way is to say that x bar is kind of asymptotically normal with the mean lambda and a variance lambda over n. So those are equivalent statements. The one on the right here just literally means the one on the left. And so this is basically our y. And we said that we need this condition. This is basically our psi squared of lambda. Here we have lambda instead of theta. And this is basically theta, right? So you can see in this case that our variance, which is lambda over n, depends on the mean, lambda, right? There's a mean variance relationship there. And so furthermore, right, our delta method says that if I look at any function, as long as it's differentiable and it's non-zero at lambda, or its derivative is non-zero at lambda, then this thing will be asymptotically normal with a mean g of lambda and a variance g prime of lambda squared times lambda over n. And what we want to do is we want to find, we want to choose g to make this constant. That's basically the game. So what do we have? We have that g prime of lambda, and I could write it maybe, let's write it like this, dg d lambda squared times lambda over n is should be equal to some constant. Um, so let's say set up our, our differential equation. And uh, how are we going to solve this? Well, I could move my lambda over n to the other side, and I could take a square root. So this would be dg d lambda is c times n over lambda. And I guess I need a square root, right? And then I can play some games. This is called separation of variables. Again, the ODEs is not required for this course. But if I were to cheat here and abuse Leibniz notation, that would say that dg is root cn over lambda times d lambda. And I would say g is basically the integral of dg. 
Yeah, right? Integration kind of undoes differentiation. Close enough. Of course, I'm a statistician, not a mathematician, so I say, yeah, close enough, right? So um, this constant doesn't really matter. Um, so I'm just going to bring it outside. It doesn't really matter what the constant is. Um, so we can just pretend I've chosen it and bring it outside. It's just an arbitrary constant. And we have a root n um, over root lambda. In fact, we don't really even care about the root n, do we? Um, so we could even ignore that, right? The reason we don't care about it is because, well, let's just absorb it into the constant. Let's just absorb all that into the constant. The main part of the thing is that basically g needs to be somehow proportional. You'll see, you'll see why I don't care about the constant. So it needs to be basically this integral. Integration, obviously, um, you can add constants. Um, so, uh, and, right, the indefinite integral like this is not really going to be a perfectly defined, well defined thing, anyways. So uh, we can kind of ignore the constants, but basically, when I integrate 1 over root x, again, it's going to be some constant times root lambda. Um, so maybe the more proper way to write this is it's like proportional to that integral. And so that integral is somehow like proportional to that. Um, and you could add, you know, you could always add on a constant rate when you do an indefinite integral, but I don't really care. Basically all I care about when I'm solving my differential equation is that, is that G is somehow kind of proportional and I could add a constant or not to root lambda. So one solution is that g of lambda is root lambda. And how can I check this is because dg d lambda is what? I think it's 1 over 2 root lambda, right? And so the variance of this thing, so my variance will be will be, what is it? It's uh, g prime lambda squared times lambda over n, which is 1 over root 2 lambda squared times lambda over n, which I think becomes 1 over 4, 4 n. Um, and you could choose, you know, you can multiply by 4 over n or something, and then you get this to be 1. It doesn't really matter. It's constant as a function of lambda. And so it works. So that's called a, a variance stabilizing transformation. It's a transformation that now, i.e., if I look at root of x bar, that's my g of lambda, this thing is asymptotically normal with a mean root lambda asymptotically and a variance of 1 over 4n. And I've removed the dependence of lambda in that variance. So I've somehow stabilized the variance. There is no mean variance relationship anymore if I do this transformation. So this is a transformation that is done specifically to, to help out sometimes when fitting models to data. Um, so that's a nice, uh, kind of more advanced, but a nice, um, nice follow on from uh, the delta method. Not something you particularly have to know how to do. ODE is not required for this course, but it's, I think it's a nice um, fun example. So that is the first order of delta method. And if you read our condition of the first order of delta method, you'll notice, wherever that definition is, that there's this condition is there, a g prime theta not to be zero. And the question is, what if it is zero? What do we do? Well, glad you ask. That is called the second order delta method. So the first one could be all the first, first order delta method. It's typically just called the um, delta method, but we can call it second order delta method. And uh, 
The second order of the delta method has a kind of similar start. It says if I have a sequence of random variables, we'll call them yn's, where root n yn minus theta converges in distribution to a normal distribution with some variance, let's call it psi squared, and g is twice differentiable. but g prime of theta is zero. So in this case, g prime of theta can be zero, but g is twice differentiable. So um, we're gonna be able to use that second derivative to get around a problem with the first derivative. And you can imagine there's called something called a third order delta method if your first derivative is zero, but blah, 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 but it's not typically used as much. Um, so the second order delta method um, if this is true, basically allows us to get around this. It says we want to say something, of course, about a function g of y. We know how y n converges in distribution. We want to say something about g of y n. And um, here's the answer is that g of y n minus g of theta. If I instead of multiplying by root n, I multiply by Oops, we're calling it capital N. I guess this should be a capital N here, right? Oops. Uh, right, so we want to say something like g of y n. Instead of multiplying my root n, I can multiply just n. And instead of converging in distribution to a normal distribution, it's going to converge to basically a chi squared. So in the first order, it converged basically to a standard normal. The second order is going to basically converge to the square of a standard normal called a chi squared with one degree of freedom. Of course there are some constants out front and it's the constants are going to be the variance term psi squared and then instead of multiplying in the first order method we multiply by the first derivative squared the second order we multiply by the second derivative divided by two. So this is called the second order delta method and it allows us to get an asymptotic distribution in cases where that first derivative disappears. And instead of converging to a standard normal, it converges to a, some scaled version of a chi-squared with one degree of freedom. So let's look at an example. Um, example. So let us have some xn's that are iid from a Bernoulli distribution with some parameter p telling us about the probability. And let g of t have an awful form. It's t by log of t over theta plus, nope, minus 1 minus t times log of 1 minus t or 1 minus theta. Where I came up with this g, nobody knows, but so where they actually come up with this t, this is called the KL divergence. Um, this is basic, it doesn't really matter, right? If you're interested, Google KL divergence. Um, it's basically a way of measuring distances between two different probability distributions. And you can think of this as measuring the distance between, if I uh, if I estimate p, oh, why did I write theta here? I'm sorry. Everyone's probably looking at me crazily, right? It should be a p, sorry. So there it is. It's t by log t over p minus one minus log, one minus t over one minus p, okay? For the sake of the problem, it's just a function and we can take derivatives of it. The reason one might care about that is it's something called the KL divergence. And it's if you imagine that if I, you know, my true underlying um, truth is P, if I estimated that thing with, instead of P, I estimated it with T. The question is, what's the distribution? This is basically the distance between um, a Bernoulli, the true Bernoulli on a P and a Bernoulli on a t. So if I were estimating p with t, how far away would I be in some sense? And so it's called the KL divergence, which is basically a way of measuring distances between probability distributions. If it makes your head spin, just say, I don't care. I don't care, right? And that 
here's a function, right? And what we're going to do is, is um, say, what can we say about about g of xn, which would basically be talking about how far away would xn be uh, if I estimated p with x bar, how far would it be from the truth? Uh, what can we say about this thing, right? So that's the question. Now, the CLT says that, of course, root n x bar minus um, now, the mean of a Bernoulli is P, so it should be P. And the variance we've said is of X bar, uh, I'm sorry, the variance of a Bernoulli is P by 1 minus P. And I think we actually did this example for the CLT. And the CLT says this converges to a normal 0, 1. Or alternatively, I could move um, that variance over and I could say X bar minus P converges to a normal 0, P by 1 minus P. Um, and that's typically how people write it for the delta method. Um, so that's what the CLT says. So it satisfies our condition, the first part of our delta method. So we have some sequence of yn's. Here it's x bar, converges to some normal. Here psi squared is p by 1 minus p. And this thing is twice differentiable. You'll believe it because uh, we're going to take two derivatives because notice that if I look at g of p, this thing is p um, by log uh, p over p. I'm sorry, we don't want to look at g of p. We want to look at, first of all, g prime is, so I'm going to do the math for you. You can check it, but I, I'm not going to do it out. If we look at the derivative of this thing, it's going to be log of t over 1 minus t minus log of p over 1 minus p. Okay, so that's g prime t, right? We'd like to just apply the delta method. However, if we look at g prime of p, this thing becomes log of p over 1 minus p minus log of p over 1 minus p is 0. And so we get that g prime of p is 0, no delta method, or at least no first order delta method. So what are we going to do? We're going to use the second order method. And the second order method says that, well, we can't say anything about, about this, but we can, uh, because our first derivative is 0, we can look at the second derivative of this thing. And again, I'm going to do the hard work for you here. I'm going to say that this is what the second derivative is. It's that, or more succinctly, it's 1 over t by 1 minus t. Okay, and that's our second derivative. And um, cool, cool, cool. Um, so the second order delta of the method, second order delta method says, well, what does it say? It says that if I look at n times g of x bar minus g of p, this thing should converge in distribution to <clears throat> Our variance was our psi in this case. Our psi was basically, here psi squared was basically um, the variance. Where did I write this down? Our variance, right, was this variance term. So it's p by 1 minus p. So it's p by 1 minus p. And then we got to multiply by g double prime. So let me, let me write it out. In terms of the psi squared times g double prime of p over 2. So that by chi squared 1. Here, psi squared is uh, p by 1 minus p. g double prime of p, or here's, here it is, is 
1 over p by 1 minus p. That works out really nicely, right? So this whole thing converges distributionally to psi squared times this. Well, that all cancels out. It's just 1 half times chi squared 1. So that's an example. It's a little bit of a complicated example of uh, the second order delta method. So we can do a quick proof of the second order delta method. I'll write it like that. Not too bad. I'm going to kind of be a little bit hand wavy on this, right? As we do with all of these, we look at a Taylor expansion. And basically, it says that g of y, right? So our theorem, right, had a supposition that root n y, uh, say y n minus theta distributionally converged to a normal zero psi squared. That was the the condition of a for the second order. So if we look at this thing, g of y n, let's say, our Taylor expansion said it should be g. And we're going to Taylor expand it around theta. It should be g of theta plus g prime of theta times y n minus theta. And you can go back to our last lecture on CLT to remember what the form of the second order Taylor expansion. Um, plus one half g double prime of theta times y n minus theta squared plus some other crap. We don't care about it. We're only going to look at the first couple terms, the second order term, the second derivative. This thing is zero, g prime theta is zero. By construction, that was assumed for the second order delta method. And so if I bring my g of theta to the other side, I have g of y n, oops, g of y n minus g of theta should kind of, by Taylor's theorem, be approximately one half g double prime of theta times y n minus theta squared. And what do I want to do now? Um, if I multiply, um, well, what do we know about um, yn, right? We know this about yn. And so if we look at that term. That's basically the same yn minus theta. Um, doesn't have the root n in there, um, does it? No. So we need to deal with that in it, in it. But if we multiply each side by root n, so if we put a root n out here, I can certainly move a root n over here. Um, What we want to do is get a root n in here, right? What I want to do is I want to insert a root n in my square here. Because if I insert that root n, then I know how this thing converges. So I'm going to basically insert a root n in there. But if I have root n squared, I'll have an n on this side. And so I need to compensate by adding an n on that side, right? So if I do that, those are still equivalent statements. I've, and I've gotten this thing, and I know this thing now. I know the convergence. This converges distributionally to a normal 0 psi squared. And so we can basically say this side converges in distribution to 1 half g double prime theta. And I can pull out, um, I could alternatively say it's psi times a normal 0, 1, right? So that thing basically converges to psi times a normal 0, 1, right? Of course, that's all in a square. And so that's the same thing as saying it converges distributionally to 1 half. I'll pull out my psi squared, g double prime theta psi squared. And then we get a normal 0, 1 squared. That is what we call a chi squared on 1 degree of freedom. So that's the proof, um, basically just using the second order Taylor approximation, which is kind of how all these things are proved. Cool, cool, cool. So what we want to do now for the rest of the lecture 
is talk about this and relate it back to estimators. So, which is basically the point of the whole class, back to estimation, all right? So we've talked about asymptotic behavior for a while. Why do we care about asymptotic behavior? So for a finite sample, we had asked the question about what's the best estimator? Right? What's the best estimator? And we had looked for, um, for unbiased estimators with small variances. That was basically the game. We looked at the UMBUE, which is the best unbiased, the smallest variance unbiased estimator. So we can also ask this asymptotically. Same question. And here, so we're going to look at, consider one, which is basically asymptotic unbiasedness and two asymptotic variance. And asymptotic unbiasedness is basically consistency. Um, Technically, there are, you know, there's a caveat here, but this is way beyond the scope of this course. But basically, in most nice cases, if your estimator is consistent, so it converges in probability to the correct thing, it is asymptotically unbiased. That is, it will, its expectation will converge to the right thing. And so the rest of this lecture, we're going to consider the second point, which is to consider asymptotic variance and talk about that. So let's first just review some, some definitions. And the definition I wanna review is consistency. And we say that theta hat is consistent. That's supposed to read consistent, consistent for theta if theta hat converges probabilistically to theta. And basically, this is some kind of measure of asymptotic unbiasedness, at least for the sake of this discussion that's good enough. And so what can we say about consistency in estimators? So here's a nice theorem. Maximum likelihood estimators are consistent. That's a super nice property. Turns out all MLEs are consistent. So I can write this out in more words, but that's basically the punchline. If theta hat is the MLE for some function tau theta, of our parameter, then theta hat converges probabilistically tau theta. Um, and uh, I'm going to put a star here, some regularity needed. And um, we're not going to worry about it. For this course, all the cases you're going to encounter in this course, this is going to work. Um, but Unfortunately, the regularity conditions on this are very, fairly complicated, so we're not going to, we're not going to go into it too much. But generally speaking, things always work out, um, and it's uh, and uh, MLEs are going to be consistent. Um, we can say works for what exponential family? Okay, so for, at least for exponential families, we don't need to worry about it too much. 
We can also, when we've used this a lot today, we can say that we had this kind of definition of asymptotic normality. And um, we can actually formalize that definition a little bit. We say that, um, let's say theta hat, it doesn't have to be the MLE, is asymptotically normal, basically if there's a central limit like theorem for it. So it's asymptotically normal with one asymptotic mean let's say tau of theta, and two asymptotic variance, let's call it, I don't know, V of theta. And um, we say this if basically there's some central limit theorem-like thing true, which is that root n times, so this thing depends on n, theta hat n minus tau of theta converges in distribution to a normal. Um, zero uh, eh, with a variance v of theta. Or alternatively, we could say that theta hat n is a n, that is asymptotically normal, um, tau theta v of theta over n. All right, and this is probably how people would be more comfortable with it, because I think um, it's just a nicer way of writing it. But that's a kind of a more formal definition of asymptotic normality. Um, and it brings it a little bit out of the CLT, right? Um, but obviously the central limit theorem is the prototypical case where we have asymptotic normality. Um, and uh, yeah, you can use the delta method to drive to drive other things there. Okay. So Let's talk about one more definition before we do an example here. And um, our definition is asymptotic relative efficiency, or ARE, asymptotic relative efficiency. Okay, so what's our definition? Um, let's have two estimators, Tn, uh, let's say capital M, we've been using capital N, and Wn. And Tn and Wn are estimators for some function of our, of our um, parameter, we'll call it function tau, so some, they're estimators for tau of theta. And they're both asymptotically normal. So Tn is asymptotically normal. The mean tau and a variance, let's just call it sigma squared t. And um, Wn is also asymptotically normal. The same mean tau of theta and a different variance, sigma squared, say w. Now, I don't explicitly say that these variances could could depend on theta. Um, presumably, they could. Here, I've in this previous definition of asymptotic normality, I explicitly said the variance could depend on theta. And we saw examples of that today, like the Poisson example, right? Um, anyway, generically, we call them sigma squared t and sigma squared w. Then the ARE asymptotic relative efficiency of Wn with respect to the so WRT with respect to Tn is, so we'll say ARE of Wn with respect to Tn is sigma squared T divided by sigma squared W. So it's the ratio of their asymptotic variances. So it's a little bit of a wonky definition. Uh, you just have to keep things straight. The ARE of W with respect to T is T on top, W on the bottom. So you kind of reverse the order. T comes second, you put it on the top. Uh, w comes first, you put it on the bottom. I mean, it's common, kind of an arbitrary definition, but this is the way that people use it. And so 
the idea being that we want to compare, so going back up to where we had started here, right? We want to compare asymptotically what's the best estimator. We want to figure that out, talk about it. And um, so we kind of talked about consistency, and we want to talk about this asymptotic variance. The idea being that if I have two estimators, T and N, and asymptotically, you know, for a large sample, which is basically what this all, all this asymptotic stuff is about, because then you say, well, if it's large, it's not, you know, you never actually going to reach infinity, but for large, it's approximately going to be true. You know, the question is, do you prefer T over W? And so you can define this quantity called ARE, which is basically the ratio of their asymptotic variances. And the idea is that if ARE of W with respect to T is less than one, then we prefer T. Because if this thing is less than one, sigma squared t is less than sigma squared w. And we prefer the one with a smaller variance um, for the same reason we do in a finite sample. It says that it's going to be, that the estimate is going to be more concentrated, hopefully, around the truth. And c conversely, if the ARE of wn with respect to tn is bigger than 1, we prefer uh, w sense if this thing is bigger than one, um, then sigma squared t is bigger than sigma squared w, or sigma squared w is smaller, we prefer the one with the smaller variance. Let's look at an example before we get into too many definitions here. So here's our example. Assume we have some Poisson data, and assume we want to estimate not lambda, but some function of lambda, called tau of lambda, which is the probability that any of our xn's is zero. All right, so what if for a Poisson, this is what is lambda to the x, the lambda zero, e to the negative lambda over x factorial, or zero factorial, right? So in this case, it's just e to the negative lambda. Um, We'll come back to why I'm pointing out that that's the probability on the x-ends is zero. All right, so I want to estimate this thing. What's a reasonable way to estimate this? Well, we know that x bar is the MLE for a lambda, right? This is something we've done before. We've shown it. So maybe we could estimate this thing with the MLE for e to the negative lambda. Well, our transformation theorem says that if x bar is the MLE for lambda, then e to the negative x bar is the MLE for e to the negative lambda, for our tau lambda. So one way is to estimate, to use this. That's one way we could estimate e to the negative lambda. And that makes sense, right? You estimate lambda and then you plug her in, right? Alternatively, we said that tau of lambda is the probability that any of my things are zero, right? And if we let yn be the indicator that xn is zero, then I think we showed before that the expected value of yn is the probability that xn is zero. So if I define, this is true just generally, if I define yn as the indicator of something related to x, then the expected value of yn is the probability of that thing, right? So it literally like, it replaces xn as zero with anything else. Uh, I think we've seen that before. And um, furthermore, we know that these yn's can take on either 0 or 1, so they are a Bernoulli random variable. 
Why are they Bernoulli? Because Bernoulli is anything that can take on zero and one. And they're Bernoulli with, Bernoulli has some parameter P and P is just the expected value of Bernoulli, which is the probability that Xn is zero, right? And um, we could consider y bar, which is the mean of these y's, right? Notice, all right, so this p is e to the negative lambda. Notice that the expected value of y bar is um, the expected value of any of them, because it's y bar, is e to the negative lambda. And the variance of this thing, so it's, so what do we say? We say y bar is unbiased. And if it's unbiased, it's certainly asymptotically unbiased. And the variance of y bar is p by 1 minus p over n, which is e to the negative lambda, 1 minus e to the negative lambda over n. And so this is another way we could call this a competing estimator. Which is also unbiased for what we want to estimate, e in the negative lambda. Um, and furthermore, you know, this thing is the MLE of our y ends, right? Because the MLE of Bernoulli, it just is the y. You know, if we have some random variables at Bernoulli, the MLE of them is just the mean, the sample mean. So this is also another kind of MLE. And it's also, you know, um, What else do we know? We know that y bar is consistent for tau of lambda by the weak law of large numbers, because the weak law of large numbers says y bar converges. So not very obvious what the better estimator is here asymptotically. Which one of these do better? E to the negative lambda, or sorry, e to the negative x bar, or form these y's and take y bar. One, e to the negative x bar, or two, um, y bar. So let's consider their asymptotic um, relative efficiencies, right? So what do we know about them? So <clears throat> we know that x bar is asymptotically normal with a mean lambda and a variance lambda over n, right? So we've done this example. Why do we know this? These things are, are Poisson, right? X bar is the MLE, and um, so we had this theorem. We go back up to our theorem, which is that uh, actually it has nothing to do with the MLE. We just know it because it's it's this is the central limit theorem. What am I saying? MLE. This is the central limit theorem, right? The CLT says that X bar is asymptotic normal with the mean, the mean of X bar and the variance, the variance of X bar, right? And uh, so by the delta method, I, I wanna look at E to the negative X bar. So let's let G of X be E to the negative X, therefore, g prime of x is negative e in the negative x, right? And so e to the negative x by the delta method 
generally g prime is not going to be zero, we can use the first order delta method. So this is kind of our first point. Our second point is that for the delta method, this thing is uh, e to the negative lambda as some type of normal with a mean e to the negative lambda, which is g of lambda, and a variance, which is g prime times the current variance. Um, so it would be negative e to the negative lambda squared times the current variance, with it, which is lambda over n, right? i.e., this thing is asymptotically normal, e to the negative lambda. Um, and then this thing is e to the, let's say, negative lambda squared times lambda over n. Let's just leave it like that. So this is fact maybe i, this is fact i, i, and we want fact i, i, i. y bar is also a mean, and it, so it is also asymptotically normal. It's the mean of what? It's not the mean of Poisson's, but it's the mean of Bernoulli's. So it is asymptotically normal with a mean p and a variance p by 1 minus p over n. Of course, p here is e to the negative lambda. This is what we said above here, right? P is e to the negative lambda. And so by the central limit theorem, it's asymptotically normal. e to the negative lambda, e to the negative lambda, 1 minus e to the negative lambda for n. So, we have derived for both our two estimators, y bar and e to the negative x bar, that, that they are both asymptotically normal. They have the same asymptotic mean, e to the negative lambda, and but they have different asymptotic variances. And so what's the ARE here? It's the asymptotic relative efficiency. So we can look at ARE of let's say y bar with respect to e to the negative x bar. And this is, of course, just the ratio of their asymptotic variances. Um, so we put the asymptotic variance of y bar on the bottom, right? So it's e to the negative lambda, 1 minus e to the negative lambda over m. And on top, we put the ARE of e to the negative x bar, or we put the asymptotic variance of e to the negative x bar, which is e to the negative lambda squared times lambda over n. And now we just have to convince ourselves, is this bigger than one, less than one? Does it depend on lambda? So what can we cancel? Well, certainly we can cancel the one over n, both the top and the bottom. And we can cancel one of those e to the negative lambdas with the e to the negative lambda in the bottom. And so what we're going to get here is a lambda on top, an e to the negative lambda on top, and a 1 minus e to the negative lambda on bottom. Um, or alternatively, we could write this as um, we could multiply by e to the lambda on top, on both top and bottom. So if I multiply by e to the lambda on top and bottom, then this will give me just a lambda on top. e to the lambda, e to the negative lambda will cancel. Now on the bottom, I will get 1, uh, I'm sorry, I will get e to the lambda minus 1. So this is just, we're just trying to convince ourselves that this thing is bigger than 1 and less than 1. My aside here is that if I look at a Taylor expansion of e to the lambda, does anyone know that Taylor expansion of e to the x? Let's say Taylor expansion generally of e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial dot 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 dot. So if I look at e to the x minus 1, this is x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial, etc. Right? So basically what I can get here is I'm going to get a lambda on top, and then on the bottom I'm going to get a lambda plus lambda squared over 2 plus lambda cubed over 3 factorial plus lambda the fourth over 4 factorial plus dot dot dot. And so on the top, we have lambda, and then we have at the bottom, we have lambda plus something positive. Um, let's say something positive 
And so this thing's always going to be less than 1 because the bottom is top plus something else. So what does that mean? Our ARE is less than 1. And so that means we prefer the second one, i.e. Um, the variance, the asymptote, we prefer e to the negative x bar. That is asymptotically more efficient. The relative, you know, it has a, a lower variance asymptotically. Um, so that's really nice. So what it showed is that is it was allowed us to choose through two different between two different estimators who were both um, kind of asymptotically unbiased. Um, so that was uh, so that's nice. That allows us to do that. So um, we can even make a definition here for what it means to be asymptotically efficient. So we say that some estimator theta hat is asymptotically efficient, efficient for say tau theta, if theta hat is asymptotically normal, uh, with the mean tau and some variance, let's call it, oh, I don't know, b for no particular reason, where our asymptotic variance is tau prime of theta, oh, let me write it this way, is d tau d theta squared over n times the Fisher information. That is, it's the Kramer Rao lower bound. So we say that <coughs> theta hat is asymptotically efficient if it, um, maybe not in a finite sample, but asymptotically achieves unbiasedness and asymptotically achieves their Kramer Rao lower bound. So there are many estimators who, in the finite case, maybe are biased and maybe are, don't achieve the kramer rao lower bound, but asymptotically they do. And we call those asymptotically efficient and they are basically the best estimators um, for, um, they're basically the best estimators um, asymptotically. because they asymptotically achieve everything we want. Unbiasedness, they achieve the variance bound. So in this previous example, we saw that um, e to the negative x achieved uh, was asymptotically more efficient. And we actually found that um, that uh, uh, what is asymptotic variance of. So let's just revisit the previous example. In the previous example, we saw that e to the negative x bar was asymptotically normal with the mean of what we wanted and the variance of e to the negative lambda squared times lambda over n. So is this asymptotically efficient? Well, what's our Kramer Rao lower bound? Can we do this? Do we remember how to do this? Oh, can we do this on the fly? So this is Poisson, right? So gosh. Um, what is i of lambda, right? Log of f of x, if f, f is Poisson, is log of lambda of x, e to the negative lambda over x factorial, which is what negative lambda uh, plus x 
log lambda minus log of x factorial. So if I take a derivative of this thing with respect to lambda, what do I get? Negative 1 plus x over lambda. If I take a second derivative with respect to lambda of this thing, what do I get? <clears throat> um, I get negative x over lambda squared. And so i of lambda is negative expected value of d log f x, or the second derivative of this thing, right? Basically the expected value of that thing, which is negative negative. We get lambda over lambda squared is one over lambda, right? So our picture information on n things is n lambda, right? So our, our Kramer row lower bound, we're basically just driving the CRLB, right? Um, so the CRLB for tau of lambda is e to the negative lambda uh, is, well, we already saw that d tau d lambda quantity squared is e to the negative lambda squared. So the CRLB is uh, e to the negative lambda quantity squared. <coughs> Um, why was it n lambda? n times 1 over lambda, thank you, times divided by i n of lambda, right? So that's e to the negative lambda squared. Uh, oops. And then we get a lambda up top and an n on the bottom. All right, so this was our CLB. Why am I deriving that? We wanted to see if this thing was asymptotically efficient. And so we wanted to see if, the as if it asymptotically if reached, was not only unbiased, but reached our bound. And indeed, we see asymptotically it's unbiased for tau of lambda. And this thing, indeed, is e to the negative lambda squared times lambda over n is this, is e to the negative lambda squared times lambda over m. So what does that mean? It means e to the negative x bar is asymptotically efficient. So asymptotically, it is basically the best estimator. Now, is this too surprising? Why might this be asymptotically the best estimator? Um, the answer is, well, what do we know about this? We go back up to our example. Way, way, way back here. What did we say? X bar is MLE for lambda. And so E to the negative X bar is the MLE for E to the negative lambda. Turns out MLEs are asymptotically efficient. That really nicely ties together um, a big section of our course. All of this all starts to come together. Estimators, MLEs, Kramer our lower bound, asymptotics. And the theorem is that MLEs are asymptotically efficient. And I could even write this, I could say theta hat is asymptotically normal. Theta hat, let's say my MLE, asymptotically normal for um, if theta has the MLE of tau of theta, it's asymptotic normal with the mean tau of theta and a variance, um, which we can write several ways, but let's say it's d tau d theta on d squared divided by n times the Fisher information for theta. And so asymptotically, you basically can't beat MLEs. So here theta hat is the MLE L E L E for tau theta. And that's the punchline of a big section of the course, which is that MLEs are really smart. Um, so you see them all over the place. And uh, for large samples, they're pretty hard to beat. 
um, as emphatically they are the efficient thing to do. There is some kind of probably some caveat on this theorem about you need a certain amount of regularity, but way beyond the scope of this course. That's kind of a PhD level topic. And uh, for this course, we'll only kind of see the nice one. So exponential families will be fine, let's say. So in the finite sample, it can be complicated. MLE is not, not always the best thing to do, but asymptotically, it's basically you can't be an MLE. So we're at about time here, so I'll, I will stop. And um, that concludes a huge section of our course. And the last topics we're going to talk about in the course are hypothesis testing um, and a little bit about confidence intervals and a little bit about p-values. And so we'll bring this so, for, so far, we've been basically talking about point estimation, and we'll talk about hypothesis testing, interval estimation, and some p-values, and that will kind of finish out the course here. Um, but I'll stop here for today.